them. But speaking in front of the audience, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always seeing direct messages. I don't know whether you are seeing them, but I can. That's fine. Excessive text, moving between screens, chart, data. Absolutely. I see that every day at schools, conferences, business meetings, universities, even online now. And you see, it's important to understand what's wrong with presentations so we can fix it. And if you want to fix it, if you really want to improve your ability to deliver great presentations, including now in an online environment, then we need to be familiar with the five key success factors for great presentations. And that's what we're going to cover today. And before we do that, just a super quick introduction from my side. Now, my name is Andrea. I'm a presentation coach. I'm the founder of Ideas on Stage in the UK. I'm in London, but we are also in Paris, Milan, Barcelona, and LA in the US. In the last 10 years, we've been working with thousands of clients from the small business owner and professional, also academics, all the way up to clients like Microsoft, Lacoste, the World Bank. We've been coaching more than 500 TEDx speakers so far. I guess you are familiar with TED Talks, TEDx, TEDx Talks. So that, that's about us, but enough about me. We are here to talk about the five key success factors for great presentations. Now, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to share with you these five key principles, and you'll see that all of them, of course, can work really well for online presentations. But anyway, they are fundamental principles of communication. So they can work really well in any other kind of presentation. It doesn't have to be online. But then after these five principles, at the end, I, so stay tuned, stay with me. I will give you some extra tips and things to consider and best practices, particularly for online presentations, okay? And I would say, let's go. Now, what are these five principles? Score, remember the word score. You want to score with your presentations. Now, P-score stands for presentation score. That's the process we use when we work with our clients. And you see score stands for simple, clear, original, related, and enjoyable. So these are the five principles, and that's what we are going to cover today. And before we get started, please, can you give me a quick exclamation mark in the chat box if we are all ready to go? Just give me a quick exclamation mark if you're still there, and then I'll get started with the first principle. Okay, perfect. I see Andrew and Krusha, Linda. Okay, fantastic. Let's go then. Simple. Now, even in an, in an online presentation, from a message, from a content perspective, you need to be able to simplify your message. Now, if you think about writing, all experienced writers know that the secret to great writing isn't in what they say. It's in what they don't say. The more they cut out and remove, the better the article or the better the book. You see, the same is true when it comes to presentations. The mistake I see all the time with business professionals, academics, even students, is that often we know so much about a subject that we think that everything is important, right? And so we think that we need to communicate everything. But put yourselves in your audience issues. If everything is important, then nothing is important. We used to work with a client some time ago. His name is Luke Breton from France. And Luke used to be one of the executive vice presidents at Orange. You may know the company, big company, Orange. And he always liked to say, I only remember one thing from a pitch or from a presentation. Just tell me what I need to know. One thing. Have you ever thought about this? Think about your next presentation. If you were to summarize the core idea behind that presentation in one message, what would you say? One message. What would you say? And how would you say in maximum 70 words? 30 seconds. <clears throat> That's it. I can tell you, if you can communicate your message in that time, then you can communicate it in longer. If not most likely your message isn't simple enough. So give it a try after this session. How can you summarize the core idea behind your next presentation in maximum 70 words? 
And if you get stuck, if you don't know what to say, then consider following this format. What, so what, what next? That's the format you can follow for you to be able to simplify your message. What, tell your audience the what, what's the key takeaway for them? What do they need to remember from your presentation? And then, so what? Why should they care? Tell them, why is this important and relevant to them, to your audience? Tell them. And then, what next? Okay, now that they care, now that they understand why it's important to them, what do you want them to do after your presentation? What do you want them to think, to believe, to, to understand, to feel after your presentation? And you see, that's one way for you to simplify your message. What, so what, what next in maximum, it could be less, it can be more, maximum 70 words, okay? So if you think about this idea of simplifying your message using this format, what, so what, what next, can you please give me a quick exclamation mark in the chat box again, if you can see how this can work in your particular context, in your communications, in your presentations. Let me know if that's the case. Okay, perfect. Great to see a few exclamation points coming in. Yeah, okay, so let's continue the second principle, clear. Not only does your message have to be simple, it also has to be clear. Now, here is the thing. Depending on your audience and the type of presentation and what you what they need and what you're trying to achieve, there are certain clear structures, because that's the thing, you need to be able to create a clear structure, a clear storyline when presenting, when communicating your ideas. So depending on the context, there are certain storylines that work better than others. Now, I'm afraid today we don't have time to go through all the different possibilities that you have. But if there is one thing that I would really like you to consider is this. And actually, let me ask you a question. Be ready in the chat box. What do you think is the most memorable number in communication? If you were to pick one number, which number would you choose? The most important, interesting, memorable number in communication? Please let me know in the chat box. Don't be afraid to be wrong, it's okay. So Geraldine says three and by the way, all the others, can you see the messages? Because I'm seeing the messages directly, directly to me. Can you all see the messages in the chat box? Maybe Geraldine, Linda, you can't see them. I don't know why, maybe it's a setting thing and but I, I can see the interaction. Okay, so I see one and three and one. Okay, so one person, Anik, Ankita, I think Ankita said three and also Linda said three and you are the winners because three is the most memorable number in communication. Three is a magic number. Mm. Why? If you look at how our brain works, all of us in short term memory, we find it very hard to remember and process more than three pieces of information. So I don't care, please trust me. Nobody does, whether you have 10 reasons or 20 reasons or a thousand reasons why they should listen to you or believe in your ideas. Or if you are a business owner or an entrepreneur, buy your products or services, just give them three. That's what people can remember. So you see your clear storyline could be as simple as a quick and interesting introduction that catches your audience's attention then you communicate your three key messages and then a powerful conclusion, making it very clear to your audience what was your point and why they should care about it. If you're not doing this today, if you're not paying attention to the way you structure your communications, your presentations, you are making it hard for your audience to follow you, remember what you say and do anything after your presentations. And that's why this is so important. Now, remember, this is called the rule of three, which is one of the simplest but most effective principles in communication, the rule of three. And again, before we continue, please, I want to make sure that this is relevant. Give me a quick exclamation mark in the chat box if you can see how you can apply the rule of three to your own presentations or communications in general. 
If that's the case, please, quick exclamation mark in the chat box. Okay, perfect. Again, everything is a direct message, but I do see some interaction. Okay, so before we, I'm going to cover all the other principles. Before we do that, let me just mention this. Now, if you are interested in presentation skills, I've put together a value bundle, which is a collection of free resources. Everything is 100% free. You've got the link in the chat box and you get access to a scorecard to assess your presentation skills, a free ebook, even the opportunity to express your interest in a free consultation with me. So if you're interested, it's free, check it out. The link is in the chat box. And now let's continue, related. And I'm going to cover original and enjoyable as well, but for now, related, what does that mean? Question for you. Let's say that in a couple of weeks, you need to give a presentation or it could be a lesson. You need to communicate something, right? And today you start preparing your presentation. Where would you start? What's the first thing you normally do when you start working on a presentation? And please, before you type anything in the chat box, don't tell me what you think you should be doing. Tell me what you actually do. What's the first thing you normally do when you start preparing a presentation? And don't wait for the others. Don't be shy. Let's make it interactive, yeah? Okay. Maheshi says, research and find out content. Geraldine introduced myself. Durham, more graphic. Yeah. Now, here is the thing. The mistake I see is that, and in a way I also see in these answers, is that what most people do Andrew says, depends on the purpose of the presentation. Absolutely. But here is the thing. What most people do is, believe it or not, they just open up PowerPoint or any other presentation tool. It doesn't make any difference. And they just put together some slides. Mm -hmm. Or some people maybe start thinking about their key messages, their content, what they want to communicate, which is much better than just opening up PowerPoint. But it's not the very first thing you want to do. Now, if you think about it, when you give a presentation, you are communicating with someone. So what you really need to do as the very first thing is to start with them. Try to understand about the audience as much as possible. Remember, when you give a presentation, it's their presentation, not yours. It's always the audience's presentation. Now, think of a presentation as a present. If I want to give you a present, it's your present, not mine. And so I need to make sure that I know you so that I can buy something that you like. You see, a presentation is very similar. When you give people a presentation, it's their presentation, not yours. And so you need to make sure that you know your audience definitely before you open up PowerPoint, but also before you start thinking about your key messages. There is a quote I love so much from Ken Hammer. He says that developing a presentation without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. And of course, you would never do that, right? Never. Now, the same applies to your presentations, including online. So in practice, for you, how can you avoid the risk of writing a great love letter, which is your presentation, but then you address it to whom it may concern. No, it has to be related to your audience. How can you do that? Well, you need to start with the A, B, C of preparation. Audience, burning needs, context. Take some time and ask yourselves some questions about the audience. Who are they? Ask yourself some questions about their burning needs. What do they really need? What do they expect from your presentation? And then ask yourself some questions about the context. For example, at what time of day will you be presenting? In what kind of room, if it's face-to-face? -face? Do you want to show some visuals? Can you do that? Is there a screen or a projector? How much time do you have? Is it an online presentation? Perfect. What tool are you going to use? How are you going to use it? How and when are you planning to interact with the audience? Some of you said that at the very beginning that one of the issues you see is the lack of interactivity. You need to plan that in advance as you start preparing your presentation. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I'm not saying that if you don't do that, then you can't create a great presentation. You can, but the risk is that you develop a fantastic presentation, but for the wrong audience. For example, and this is a true story. Some time ago, we were working with a client. Her name is Marie from Paris. And Marie is an executive. She's an expert in leadership. And she was invited by an association in Finland to give a talk about leadership. And she was super excited. It was one of the first international speaking opportunities. So she prepared really well. She knew her message, what she wanted to communicate. She told us that she had 50, 5 zero, 50 beautiful slides that she wanted to show. And also from a delivery perspective, she rehearsed, she prepared properly. So she was ready to go. She flew to Finland the day before the conference, then arrived there on the day half an hour before the audience because she wanted to make sure that she had time to set things up. And when she was about to connect her laptop to the screen, she realized that there was no screen. So a little bit of panic, she went and asked the organizers, assuming that they would say, oh, sorry, now we're going to fix this for you, Murray, we're going to find a screen somewhere. But actually what they did was, they started laughing. They started laughing. And so she says, why are you laughing? And they said, look, Marie, you want to show 50 slides, but actually you've been invited to give a talk to the association in Finland of blind people. Blind people. Now, I know it's an extreme example. Extreme example, but it happened for real. Marie was very well prepared, apart from one thing. She didn't know her audience. She didn't even take the time to translate the name of the association from Finnish to French, and she would have realized that perhaps there was no need to have 50 beautiful slides. So remember, if you want to make your presentations more relevant, related to your audience, start with the ABC of preparation. And so just out of curiosity in the chat box, please type one if you think that you are already doing a great job at making your presentations as relevant as possible to your audience, type two instead if you think that maybe there is some room for improvement. Please let me know in the chat box, either one or two. Okay, I see many twos coming in. Okay, room for improvement. Okay, good to know. Right. And then finally, your presentations also need to be original and enjoyable. Why? Because if that's not the case, the risk is that they remain a bit dry and factual and boring. Right? And definitely, you don't want to be a boring presenter. As Dr. John Medina says, the brain doesn't pay attention to boring things. Never. The brain never pays attention to boring things. That's why once you have a simple and clear message which is related to your audience, you need to spice it up. You need to color it in. You need to make it original and enjoyable. How can you do that? Now, again, there are many things you can do. We don't have time today to go through all the different possibilities that you have. But again, if there is one thing I would really like you to consider is this. And I'm sure you've heard it for good reason. Many times stories. Storytelling is very important in communication. Include stories in your presentations. Why? Well, it's very simple. People remember stories much more than just facts and figures. And it doesn't have to be an, like a once upon a time type of story. It could be, it depends on your context. It could be your own personal experience and how it relates to your message. It could be if you are a business owner or a business professional, it could be something that happened to one of your clients. And again, how that's connected to your message. It could be an example, an anecdote. If you think about analogies, analogies are super useful, especially when you need to communicate complex or technical concepts. Analogies are very, very effective. If you think about it, there is always a story to tell. Now, to give you an example, I don't want to use me as an example, not at all, but just to give an idea. Just now, 
I told you the story of Marie, who was invited to give a talk to the Association of Blind People in Finland and what that meant in relation to my message. Now, my message was that you have to start with the audience. And you see, I could have communicated that message as it is, just start with the audience. But no, I also asked myself, okay, what story can I tell to illustrate the point, to make him memorable? And that's what the audience will remember. I can promise you in a few days, in a few weeks, you will still remember Marie's story and what that means. The problem with most presentations is that they are 99% facts. And then if we are lucky, 1% is story. We should turn this around. So tell more stories. And that's the best thing you can do to make your very next presentations more original and enjoyable. Okay. And there you go. Presentation. Remember, you want to score with your presentations. Simple, clear, original, related, and enjoyable. Simple because the more you say, the less they remember. So you need to keep it short, simple, and to the point. Clear because your key messages should be obvious to everybody, including you as the presenter. Original because you want your presentation to stand out, to be a bit different so that they will pay more attention and remember it for longer. Related because remember, it's their presentation, not yours. And so you need to make sure that what you say is useful and relevant to them, to your audience. And then enjoyable, well, of course, if your audience enjoys your presentation, again, they will pay more attention and remember more. Remember to score with your presentations. Now, let me ask you a question. And then after that, I'm going to give you some specific tips and best practices just for online presentations, okay? But for now, let me ask you this question. How ready are you to score with your presentations? Like to apply these five principles to your own presentations or communications in general. Please type from one to four in the chat box where one means, no, I'm not ready. This is complicated. Maybe this doesn't apply to me or it doesn't work for me to four. And four would mean I'm 100% ready. I know exactly what to do. So please let me know in the chat box from one to four. Okay, I see two and three, three, four, that's good. So most of you are telling me three, which in my eyes means I, I will give it a try, yeah, which is, which is good to know. Okay, Geraldine as well, three, perfect. Okay, as I said, I've got one more thing for you because I do want to give you some specific best practices for online presentations. And here they are, technology, eye contact, body, and interaction. These are the four key things you really want to consider just for online presentations. Why? Because first of all, from a technological perspective, now technology and the setup doesn't make a big difference in face-to-face -face presentations, but for obvious reasons, it does in online presentations. So these are the key things you want to consider from a technological perspective. Connection, headphones, microphone, webcam, light, and background. So connection, it may sound obvious, but it's not. Cable connection is much better and much more stable than Wi-Fi. So if you can, of course, we are all working from home at the moment, most of us, but if you can, keep it in mind. Headphones. Now, you see me, for example. Now, I don't know where online whether you have, you, you have had that experience of you presenting and then you can hear the sound of your voice coming back to you. And that's very annoying. It's very hard to keep the attention high for also for you as a presenter. So if you've got headphones like this, that makes it less likely for that to happen. So highly recommend it. Another thing is microphone. Try not to use the microphone, which is already included in your device, whether that's a, a tablet or a, a computer or a laptop. If you have an external one, it could be USB microphone. It could be one of those lapel microphones that you attach here. They improve. Remember that online, your voice is the most important virtual tool you have. Sometimes it's the only tool you have. So again, keep it in mind, an external microphone. Similarly, webcam. Try not to use the webcam, which is already included in your device. Use an external one. Again, it makes the overall experience for the audience much better. You step it up 
from a setup perspective. Light. Now, what that means is that if you can present in front of a window, that's great. You want to have a good source of natural light coming to you. If that's not possible, then you may want to have an external light. Now, at the moment, I have both. So maybe it doesn't make a big difference. Let's see. But now I'm going to turn it off my external light. Let's see what happens. Can you see the difference? And I also have a window in front of me. So this is on, off. You see, on, off. So again, keep it in mind. It doesn't have to be expensive. Even with 20 pounds, you can find something that makes the overall experience for the audience much better. And then background, just watch your background. Again, we are working from home. It doesn't have to be perfect or super professional, but it has to be clean. Yeah, you don't want the background to be distracting. You are the presentation, not your background, okay? So these are the key things for you to consider from a technological perspective for online presentations. Then eye contact. Now, the way you make good eye contact online is different from the way you make good eye contact in a face-to-face -face presentation. What you want to do online is very simple. Look there, look at the lens of the camera. That's where your audience is. Uh, for example, now I could be looking at my slides or maybe in a meeting, I could be looking at other people. But if you want to make a strong connection, you see you need to change and you need to look, train yourselves to look as much as possible at the lens of the camera because that's where your audience is. And ideally, you want to have your eyes for perfect eye contact. You see, the best angle for the camera to capture your face is at the same level as your eyes, pretty much. So you don't want to have your camera looking down to you like this, right? You don't want, you, you don't want to look down to the camera because every time you do that, then it feels aggressive from a communication perspective. Sometimes that means that you need to maybe raise your computer with a laptop stand or with some books, but make sure that your camera captures your face at the same level as your eyes. And that's the ideal setup for you to be able to make strong eye contact when communicating online. And then body, body language. Now, here is the thing, online, you can't move as much as you could do in a face-to-face -face presentation. But what you can do is you can use this. I always tell my clients here in the UK that they should speak Italian with their hands. Now I'm Italian and they say that we Italians use our hands a lot. And I'm sure it's true, of course, without overdoing it. But you see, the way you use your hands can be very important for you as a presenter, to better get your message across, but also for the audience to follow you and understand your messages and remember them. It also shows your passion and your enthusiasm for your subject. Now, the key thing, again, a clear difference between a face-to-face -face presentation and an online presentation, you see now I'm using my hands without thinking about it, online presentation versus face-to-face -face presentation. But the key is that you want to keep your hands a little bit higher than you would normally do in a face-to-face -face presentation or conversation. You see, face-to-face, -face, you will never keep your hands here, right? It would be strange. But online, it makes sense because your audience needs to see them. So that's a quick tip for you to consider. Keep them a little bit higher and use them, show them. And then finally, interaction. Again, some of you told me at the very beginning that one of the things you don't like is the interaction, the, le the lack of interaction. Now, here is the thing. If you interact with your audience, that helps you gain your audience's attention. So interaction equals attention. And if you think about it, the audience's attention is a bit like the sand in an hourglass. If you think about the sand in an hourglass, it runs out after a few minutes, but it's very easy to flip you over and start again. So you see, it's not up to the audience to work hard to keep their attention. It's up to you as the presenter to work hard to gain their attention and to keep it high. And the best way for you to do that is to include moments of interaction. It could be as simple as asking a question, or you see, in, again, I don't want to use me as an example, but just to give an idea, asking the audience to type a quick exclamation mark in the chat box. You can create, there are many possibilities, but you can create moments of interaction. Now, the difference, again, 
face to face, consider if you look at how our brain works, then physiologically the audience's attention goes down after about 10 minutes. So it's as if every 10 minutes you need to buy the audience's attention back. So consider that every time you are presenting something, it could be a presentation, a conversation, it could be a lesson with some students. If it's more than 10 minutes, uh, every 10 minutes, at the very least, you need to do something that creates that kind of interaction, which could be as simple as asking a question, although there are many other possibilities. Now, online, whether we like it or not, but we have an extra barrier, which is technology. So online, it's harder to keep the attention high, which means that you need to create even more moments of interaction. I would say every five minutes, at the very least, every five minutes, try to include a moment of change, some sort of interaction with the audience. And that's what will help you gain and keep their attention. So you see, in addition to the five score principles, remember these four practical things for you to consider, particularly for online presentations. Pay attention to the setup from a technological perspective, eye contact, look at the lens of the camera, body, use your hands, speak Italian with your hands, and then interaction, find a way to keep the attention high. And that's it. I do hope you enjoyed it. I hope you find it useful. We've got plenty of time. I would be very happy to take any questions. There is a poll in progress as well. So I would say I will give you just a few seconds now to complete the poll. And then there is one, just one more thing I'd like to share with you, or a couple of other quick things, and then we can open it to the, we can open to the Q&A. Ashia, you, you tell me when the poll is completed, okay? Yes, sure. We can carry on, Andrea. Um, so the poll can be there for a few minutes. It's okay. Oh, okay, so. right. No problem. In that case, just a couple of other things. Now, as I mentioned again, if you do want to get access, instant access for free to many other resources, including the possibility for you to express your interest in a free one hour consultation with me, then there is a link in the chat box, LS, if you don't mind, and it was before as well, feel free to get access to it and then and see, see whether that can help. And then the other thing is the presentation score Facebook group. If you are on Facebook, then again, there should be a link coming in in the chat box. It's a private community Facebook group of people, professionals who are all interested in these ideas, presentation skills. It's private, but as a thank you for you attending this session, I would be very happy to, to approve it for you. So feel free to request access and, and we'll approve it. And I hope to see you there. And that's it. So potentially there is one more thing I'd like to share with you, but I would be very happy to do that later. For now, I would also be very happy to take any questions. So what questions do you have? Alice, I don't know whether we had any questions already in the chat box. Thank you very much, Andrea. We are waiting for a question to come up. Okay, no, that's totally fine. And I would say now you can, you can either type your questions in the chat box or if you prefer, I would say even better, feel free to unmute yourselves and we can have a bit of a chat. I see something already. Uh, Andrew, do you have any specific advice for presentations for interviews? Andrew, that's a great question. Advice for presentations for interviews. The best piece of advice there, Andrew, from my side is connected to what we said about the ABC of preparation. In an interview, you want to make sure that whatever you say is related to the audience, to the interviewer and what they need. So try to learn as much as possible about them about the company what they're looking for and then as you prepare your presentation the key messages you want to communicate try to find ways to say something that's relevant to them and what they need so it's less about the presentation in those contexts and more about the preparation in terms of how much you know about them and what they need as a relatively brief answer andrew does that does that answer your question and I know that it's a longer journey. I'm afraid some of the questions I'm sure can be solved in just five minutes. Okay, so 
let me let me see. I also see Maheshi. How do you fearlessly speak to an audience? Any tips? Maheshi, it's practice, practice, practice. If you're not used to this, then the first time you do it, you speak in public, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, maybe you feel a bit nervous. And I can tell you, if you do feel a bit nervous, then you are not alone. Mark Twain used to say that there are two types of speakers, those who are nervous and those who are liars. That's it. So if somebody tells you, I don't feel anything before a presentation, I don't believe them. So it's just, a, you just need to have the, the, you just need to make a decision to do it anyway, to present, to speak in public, despite the nerves, if that's your situation. And if you make that decision enough times, then you will get to a point where it becomes more of a natural thing to do. Okay. Let me see here, how to close or summarize a presentation? Dharam, great question. How do you close or summarize a presentation? For me, it's two different things. Now, first of all, yes, a summary is important. So for example, today, Dharam, we talked about the rule of three, that you can structure your presentation with three key messages. So you've got three key messages. After the third message, then you want to, you want to summarize. And you could say something like, so the message from my presentation is simple. And then ask yourself, okay, what's the key message from your presentation? You want to keep your summary very brief. So the message from my presentation is simple. And then you tell them what the message is after your third key message. Or oh, everything we said today leads to one conclusion. And then you tell them what the conclusion is. So a summary is very important, but it's not the conclusion. So I see them as two different things. After the summary, then you want to have a bit of a Q&A if it's appropriate, depending on the context. And then your conclusion. Now, for example, again, we talked about the way you can simplify your message with the what, so what, what next. I don't, I don't know if you joined at the beginning, but at the beginning, we talked about the what, so what, what next. If you think about it, once you've simplified your message and you've prepared your 70 word, what, so what, what next paragraph, that can work really, really well for your conclusion as well. At the end, you tell them what it is that, that you want them to take away. Remind them again, so what? Why does this matter to them? And then what next? What do you want them to do or to think or to believe after your presentation? Okay, perfect. I see maybe a few. Oh, there are many other questions. I don't know if I can cover all of them. Let's see. So Maheshi, how much of space to you in the presentation slide. It doesn't look too cluttered. When to use dark, bright color slides. So your question, Mahesh, is about presentation design. And you're right. Now, again, I don't want to use me as an example, but the, the approach you spotted is, is correct. Now, you want to keep your slides as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. One idea per slide, not two. If you've got two ideas, then you should have two slides and try to keep them very simple, simple and visual. There is a principle in design, a universal principle in design called picture superiority, which tells us that images are more likely to be remembered than words. Mm -hmm. So if you think about billboards, I'm in London, I don't know if you're in London or in the UK, Piccadilly Circus. If you think about Piccadilly Circus, if you picture the billboards, they are very visual and big image, just a few words. Why? Well, because they need to capture our attention in just a few seconds. Now, what if we apply the same principle to the way we design our presentations? Think of your slides like billboards. You need to capture the audience's attention in just a few seconds. Whenever you show something on the screen, either online or in a face-to-face -face presentation, it has to be so simple and intuitive that your audience should be able to understand the message behind it in just a few seconds. So keep it in mind. Then dark, bright color slides. From that perspective, uh, Maheshi, I always recommend a dark background for live presentations when you are there as a presenter communicating your ideas. If we are talking about a document that you need to submit maybe before, during, or after the presentation, then a white background might work a bit better, okay? 
Geraldine, what do you suggest home backgrounds are better than digital ones like bookcases? Yes, now, Geraldine, this is, unless, unless that's a great question, by the way, backgrounds, natural backgrounds or digital ones. Now, unless the digital background, unless you have a setup that allows you to, to make it perfect, I don't recommend it. And by that, what I mean is, if you, if you really want to get it right, if you want to have a digital background that works well, then ideally you want to have a green screen behind you. I don't know if you are familiar with the concept of a green screen. So it's basically like a panel that you buy, it's green. And if you've got something green behind you, then any software, any software is trained automatically to pick up the color. And what they do then, when you, when you use a digital background, then they recognize that whatever is green should in fact become the digital background. And that allows you to solve one big problem with digital backgrounds, which is, if you think about it, often when people start to move, if you move your hands or if you move your body, then you can see that it's fake, that it's digital, right? Whereas if you have a professional green screen, then that works very well, okay? So unless you've got that setup, I wouldn't recommend it. As long as, of course, you've got something at home, which is not too, it shouldn't be distracting for the audience. Geraldine, as a relatively brief answer, does that answer your question? Yeah, maybe thumbs up if that's the case. Okay, perfect. Let's see. If one question before Geraldine is missing, so you didn't answer, sorry. If uh, I just read the question for you, it says, um, how to close or summar summarize the presentation? Yeah, I see. I've just answered that question about the with the conclusion, the what, so what, what next? And then we talked about the summary as well. Yeah. Sorry, I thought yeah. it's not been. Oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. Let's see. I've got another one. Is it, it is possible to tell when a presenter is shy in online presentations? Is there a way to overcome lack of confidence? I think you answered my question. Right? Yeah, I was about to say that. Yes, it's just practice, practice, practice. The more you rehearse, the more you practice, the more comfortable you will become. There is no substitute for practice, yeah? Okay, and maybe because I don't see any other questions, just one more thing which is connected to the last question is, you see, there is a, when I talk about practice and rehearsing, some people tell me, you know what, I don't like to rehearse because, because I want to appear more natural and I don't want to sound robotic. But actually, it's as counterintuitive as this may seem, but it's the opposite. The more you rehearse, the more you practice, the more natural you will appear. You see, rehearsing is a bit like climbing a mountain. Imagine that you need to climb a mountain and you start going up. So you go up and then you stop. If you stop, you will never get to the top of the mountain. So you need to keep going up so that you can reach to the top, you can reach the top, and then you can start going down. Rehearsing is the same thing. If you say that you have a very important presentation coming up, and then you rehearse, you start going up, you go up the mountain. So you rehearse maybe once or twice, and then you stop, then of course it's not enough. Of course you will appear robotic. So what you need to do is you need to keep going up, which means that you need to rehearse a few more times so that not only will you not appear robotic, but actually it's the other way around. You will, know you will have internalized your content. I'm not asking anybody to memorize, but you need to internalize. You need to own your content because then if you do that, then you can also start thinking about some delivery techniques like eye contact and gestures, some of the things we've talked about today. But if you think about it, if you don't own your content, it's very hard to get the delivery side of things right. If you don't own your content, it's difficult for you to start thinking about eye contact or what to do with your hands. So that's why rehearsing is so important. And then as a consequence, connected to your question also helps you with confidence, okay? And I hope I've answered all the questions. Thank you very much, we did actually, indeed. Thank you very much, it was a great session, very helpful. Um, Many thank you coming out through the chat box. Um, they found it very insightful. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, um, Andrew. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. It was 
very, very clear and very insightful, very interesting. Thank you very much, Geraldine and Asia. It's, it's great to be collaborating with Brunel University and I'm very happy to hear that it's been useful and that you enjoyed it. Asia, it's really up to you. This is your show really. So if you want to conclude, it's really up to you. No, you can do that just before everybody goes. If you would like to hear more from Andlu or you want to get in touch with him related to get more skills related to a specific thing, you are in a, you want to apply for a job, you want to do certain thing and you want to get more tips from Andrew in a pool, which we launched it earlier. It was a question asking you whether you would like to be contacted by Andrew or not later on um, for a follow-up email. If you have selected that as a yes, then Andrew will contact you and send you email, follow-up email and you can take it from there and contact him more and get more um, from his expertise and his knowledge. And I found it wonderful and it was very, very helpful, Andrew. And, um, and if you want to say anything, you feel, free to do, you feel free to do that. Otherwise, the session is over and I close the recording. Thank you. Yes, nobody has ever complained because a presentation has finished earlier than planned. The opposite is the case. But yes, if there is one thing I would really like all of you to remember is this. Now, remember, today more than ever, there's never been a better time for you to become a better presenter. Why? Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you think about what's happening with things like automation and artificial intelligence and technology and robots and also COVID, of course, you see, today more than ever, having a good idea isn't good enough. Think about it. If you want to, depending on who, what your situation is, but if you want to sell your products or lead teams or build brands or trigger movements, then you need to be able to persuade people and inspire them. And you see, this is not something that a robot will be able to do, never. This is not something that now Zoom or Microsoft Teams will do for you. You still need to take responsibility for communicating your ideas in the most effective way. That's why being able to present effectively is a skill that will become only more important, not less. So if you are here today, it's because maybe, maybe not, but maybe you are only at the beginning of your journey to becoming the best presenters you can be. And I can promise you, it's the smallest investment you can make in yourselves in order to make the biggest difference to your, to your career and to your journey, personal and professional journey. So keep going. You won't regret it and your audience will. Thank you. And I also want to thank you very, very much. Ciao. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.